Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation to speak at this, uh, this nice seminar. Um, I hope it continues uh, in the future. Um, so first, yeah, before I, before I start, let me just say that pretty much everything I want to talk about today is joint work with um, Ian Petro. So I also want to say, so I've given talks on this, on these, uh, some of th these works at other venues and, and, um, uh, and so I've, I've tried to, uh, and so I know some of the, 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 the specialists have seen this uh, stuff before. And so, um, I, I tried to tried to pitch this talk at, at a more broad audience. Um, you, you can judge for yourself if I uh, succeeded at, at that or not. <laughs> but uh, I've made some attempt at that. Uh, so um, okay, so let's just start. Um, so the the theme to uh, uh, kind of motivate uh, this overall uh, uh, talk today, to at least the beginning part, is uh, I want to compare and contrast uh, the Riemann data function with Dirichlet L functions. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, going going way back in history, the uh, we it's well known that um, properties of the Riemann data function um, can be used to prove the prime number theorem. Um, there's a pretty standard um, zero free region for the data function um, uh, of this of this form. So the the um, Sort of like this distance one over log t away from um, the line one, uh, we know that there are no zeros. Um, for zeta, we do actually know um, a larger um, zero free region, um, uh, like this Vinogradov Korobov uh, type region, and um, uh, larger zero free regions lead to better error terms in the uh, prime number theorem. So that's one reason for uh, being interested in that. Um, likewise, uh, uh, we, we also have um, Dirichlet L functions, and um, we know that property, properties of them, especially zero-free regions, uh, can be used to prove the prime number theorem in arithmetic progressions. Um, so just like for zeta, there is a sort of standard one over log um, distance away from, from one um, zero-free region. Um, with uh, this uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, exception of a possible um, real zero uh, when chi is uh, quadratic. Um, I don't really have anything to say about, about this problem. This is just, I, I wanna compare and contrast these things. So there's some, some things that are similar between zeta and, and Dirichlet functions and some things that are different. So one difference here is this possible real zero um, that doesn't have an analog uh, with the zeta function, but there's also this, um, improved zero free region, uh, this vinograd of Korobov kind that I didn't even write down um, explicitly because it's not really gonna come up uh, later in the talk. But, um, but yeah, so this is a case where we have a better zero free region for the data than for Dirichlet L functions. Um, okay, another example, another kind of theme to compare and contrast uh, zeta and Dirichlet L functions are with um, moments. And so there's all sorts of moment problems that, that we could discuss. And um, I uh, uh, chose the, the fourth moment uh, of, of zeta to be a, a, just a, you know, something to, uh, just a sort of representing example. So the, the, the state of the art uh, for um, the fourth moment of zeta is that um, we have an asymptotic formula for it. Uh, it's t, and then there's some polynomial in log of t, some degree four polynomial in log of t, and then the best known error term is um, t to the two thirds plus epsilon. Um, I'm not exactly sure where this was first proved, um, but certainly um, a proof can be found in Motohashi's um, book um, on the spectral theory of the Riemann data function. Um, I know some people cite um, Zavarotny uh, for this, but I, I wasn't able to uh, find that paper. Um, I believe it's also in Russian. So um, anyway, so I'm not sure, but it, again, I, uh, this is just a kind of a representative uh, 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 thing here for this discussion. Um, and backing up a little bit, uh, so the, the first um, asymptotic formula with, with some kind of power saving, so some exponent here that's strictly less than, than one, and this here is two thirds, oops, it's two thirds, um, 
uh, but the, the first uh, non-trivial power saving was due to Heath Brown um, 20 years before Motohashi's book, uh, which was of size t to the seven over eight. Um, okay, there's a, an analogous question for Dirichlet functions. So we can look at the fourth moment of Dirichlet functions. Um, and again, it's, it's a kind of a similar problem. We have a asymptotic formula. It's, now it's Q, let's just say Q is a prime. Um, Q times some degree four polynomial in log of Q um, plus some error term of size uh, 19 over 20 is, is the state of the art. And this is much more recent um, um, and due to Blomer, Fufri, Kowalski, Michelle, and Melisevich from 2017. Um, and, the, whereas the, and then the first power saving error term um, took much longer than, than Heath Brown's result it, it, um, uh, first appeared in, in 2011. And I don't even remember what the exponent was. This is, has a, a sort of larger denominator. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. So just, you know, we can see just, even if you don't know about the techniques that might be used, we can see that there's a, a, a long delay in time going from Zeta to Dirichlet, and also the exponents are not the same. So there's also a, a you know, sort of deficient and, and the same quality of the error term. So we're, we're seeing some difference between Zeta and, and Dirichlet here. So, you know, I think it's good to think about like what, what's the underlying reason for this difference between these things. Um, so one, one answer to this is that um, we often can produce results like we, we collectively as a community, not, not the, me, the royal we, but uh, we, we can, the, the, there are many, many instances of results where um, Dirichlet L functions are more on an equal footing with the Zeta function. But when, our, when we look at um, moduli IQ, that factor into many small prime factors, like when Q is smooth. Um, and that's kind of the, 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 the right thing that lets us adapt some of the tools from the Zeta case into the Dirichlet function case. Um, but when Q is prime, then we, certainly can't, there's no factorizations possible. And um, so, the, so, so some of those tools are missing. And so this is maybe the, some explanation for why there's this lag. Um, we have a question in the chat room. Oh, okay. Shub uh, Rachit, maybe please unmute and just ask away. So uh, maybe, your microphone's not working. I'll just uh, read the question out loud. What is the significance and motivation beh behind studying the moments of all functions? Well, so yeah, that's a good question. So we're, I mean, we're we're interested in statistical properties of like how how big the zeta function can be or l functions can be. Um, it's just, uh, but they're they're also used for um, other problems. Like if we want to. Um, uh, get non-trivial bounds, or um, they're also used for um, proving non-vanishing results. I guess if you have an asymptotic formula for some moment of all functions, that means they can't all vanish. Um, so they're they're one of our only ways we can get really our hands on L functions <laughs> um, is by putting them in families and by studying moments. I don't know if that's a good enough answer, but there, there's. So, um, right. So, for the for these fourth moment problems, a little more specifically, I just I, I thought I could include a little bit of information about why these for the fourth moment problem why they're different. Um, and so the so one of the reasons is so for the for the fourth moment of the zeta function, what we have to study are these shifted divisor problems. So d, d of n times d of n plus h, where um, for zeta, uh, the, what, what happens is h, the shifting variable is kind of small. And so that means we're looking at pairs of divisors that are close by, like cl meaning close by as real numbers, n and n plus h are close to each other. Um, if you study the same problem for, for the, the fourth moment of Dirichlet L functions, you also get a kind of shifted divisor problem. Um, but these two numbers n and n plus h are no longer close as real numbers, but they're close modulo q, and they might be quite far apart as uh, real numbers. And um, this causes all sorts of 
problems. Uh, that's, um, so when you're actually trying to prove things about the fourth moment of theta, this is one of the, the, the main issues. Um, so somehow like this close in the Archimedean sense, you know, as real numbers versus close, maybe quadratically. is the third, these have different things, these have different um, behaviors. Okay, so so for my my third sort of warm up uh, uh, problem about comp to compare and contrast uh, zeta and Dirichlet L functions is uh, uh, b individual bounds for L functions. So um, uh, so I, I want to discuss uh, the vial bound for for the Riemann zeta function. So this was. Uh, I think proved by Hardy and Littlewood, but using Vial's differencing method as the, the key um, input. And so they proved a bound that says that zeta on the half line grows like t to the one over six. There's a, what you might, you know, to judge this, uh, we have to compare this to, you know, what you might call a trivial bound. Um, so one, one well-known way to, you know, uh, Represent the trivial bound is, is, is called the, the, the convexity, called the convexity bound, and then it's the bound that results from the fragment Lindelof convexity principle. Um, it's 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 not it, it's just using the functional equation and the um, you know properties of the zeta function um, where it converges absolutely. So it, it's not really yeah it, it's it's only using that weak information about zeta. So this vial, this method of vial is is useful for more than just bounding the zeta function. It, it's 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 used to um, bound um, pretty general exponential sums, um, like e to the two pi i f of n, where f is some reasonable function. Um, and the case for zeta would be if this thing is n to the i t or n to the minus i t. And um, this has other applications to lattice point counting problems and, and, and um, other problems. Now for the case of Dirichlet L functions, it took much longer before um, anyone obtained a, sub or a, a bound that's better than convexity. Uh, and so this, this goes back to Burgess, uh, 1963. So he proved um, this bound Q to the three over 16. So the, in this case, again, the, the convexity bound is still like the same exponent, this one over four, so q to the one over four, over four. So three over 16 is less than one over four, and it's also bigger than one over six, so it's somewhere in between those. So this Burgess bound is, is non-trivial, it's better than convexity, but it's also not as good as this, um, uh, the vial bound, uh, which predated it by, by many decades. Um, Burgess's method has also been useful for, for other things, like so it's, it's, it's one, one neat application is for estimating the first quadratic non-residue uh, modulo a prime. So another, another thing to mention here uh, is that one of the inputs into Burgess's bound is, um, so he needed some, he had a, a certain a, a exponential or character sums uh, modulo a prime, and he needed square root cancellation in those, in those sums. And um, this was provided by um, the Riemann, Riemann hypothesis for curves over a finite field. So there's some, um, some, some deep algebraic input. Okay, so that was, so Burgess's result was the, the state of the art for a very long time. And um, in 2000, Conry Nivaniens improved this uh, for um, quadratic characters. And so they, um, um, proved a, a vial quality bound. So it's the same exponent one over six that, that vial got for the zeta function. Um, um, okay, so this was a, this was a big deal. Uh, um, and um, uh, so what do I want to say? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so they prove this for chi quadratic. What I want to be discussing um, uh, throughout this talk is, is generalizing, generalizing this to more general characters. Um, and the, 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 the method is also very interesting. So it's completely different from these earlier, 
results of, of, of Bile and, and Burgess. And, and what it does is it, um, it studies uh, moments. So this maybe possibly answers one of that the earlier question of why are we in, interested in moments? So one, one reason is it helps us uh, to understand even individual values. Um, and so the, the, their approach for, for getting this bound is, um, so it's, it's quite interesting. So the, this, this, this degree one L function, they think of it as a degree two L function, uh, 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 absolute value squared, um, or maybe to put, put this in a better term. So, uh, so if you, so they, they cook up a family, a, a GL2 family of um, automorphic forms. And um, that family contains cusp forms and Eisenstein series that come together in a natural way. And the Eisenstein part of that um, family um, gives rise to this Dirichlet L function, absolute value squared. Um, now, in, in an upcoming slide, I want to be more precise about what a moment they look at, what family they look, they look at, and so on. But I'm just saying here that this is it's an interesting method because it um, goes to this GL2 family. Another, another thing to mention is that um, uh, an important input in their um, proof is uh, it goes beyond Burgess in that there's a, uh, they have a certain character sum, um, but it's in two variables instead of one variable, um, and they need square root cancellation in that character sum, and um, that this is uh, crucially provided by um, the Riemann hypothesis for varieties over a finite field um, through by domain. So it, it's, it's harder in that sense. So, um, so at the time Burgess was working, we, did, we didn't have a proof of, um, proof of this, Deline did this in the 1970s. Another thing to say about their work, they, um, their work um, doesn't just bound the Dirichlet L functions, it also bounds quadratic twists of, of cusp forms. So just to, as, a, as an example, um, if you take a level one cusp form like the, the Ramanujan delta function um, and twist it by quadratic characters, then um, they get this bound of Q to the one over three plus epsilon. Um, <clears throat> we should think of the one over three as, um, as a, it's, one, it's really one over six, but it's Q squared to the one over six. The, the, so the conductor of this twisted L function is Q squared. And so this is again, the same exponent one over six. Um, so this is another reason this is interesting is that um, uh, I, I work with Walter Bruget and, and further refined by Conan and Zagier, the, these families of quadratic twists of these GL2 L functions are um, related to um, Fourier coefficients of half integral weight cusp forms. And so if we can bound quadratic twists of L functions then we can bound these half integral weight Fourier coefficients. Um, so I also, I, I, I wrote a paper um, some years back that studied uh, um, some other variants on this problem for uh, like shrinking sets and, and, and other things like that. Um, and so these, these, these questions, uh, these subconvexity bounds have um, applications to equidistribution problems for, for Higner points, um, integral points on ellipsoids, like integral points on the sphere and um, uh, other things. Okay. So the main main thing main result I want um, to mention uh, today is, uh, is this theorem with uh, with Ian, uh, which says that for cube free moduli we have this file quality bound q to the one over six. Um, in particular, for q prime and for any character chi, then we get this bound. So I think this is um, probably the hardest case to. Uh, to, to keep in mind is just the case when Q is a prime. There, I mean, when, when Q has some factorizations, there are some other techniques that might be useful. To, um, but when Q is prime, those are certainly off the table. And um, just like uh, Conry and Ivanius, the main um, idea uh, to get started is to put this Dirichlet L function absolute value squared into a family um, so that the corresponding Eisenstein series um, gives you this, this L function squared. And then to, and then to work with this family. Um, 
another key input will be the liens bound. Um, although we have to use some more advanced uh, uh, inputs and to, to be able to use the liens bound. So we actually wrote two papers. So the first one uh, came out on the archive in, in 2018, it was, it was published uh, last year. Um, and then we have a follow-up paper where basically it just lets us uh, delete cube free and just say that it holds for all Q. Um, so one part of the talk is to try to explain why we had this condition that Q was cube free and then how did we um, remove that uh, condition and, and prove it for all Q. And just you know, for the sake of interest, uh, we also the, the, the method doesn't. I, I've, I've been mainly just looking at these L functions at a half, um, just for simplicity. But um, um, the, the method also really treats T and Q on an equal footing, and we get this hybrid type bound. So it's T times Q to the one over six power. So it's, it's completely uniform in how it treats T and Q, at least in terms of the, the bound. The, I mean, the method is, has, we have to work a lot harder for the Q aspect than for the T aspect, let's, let's put it that way. <clears throat> so um, that was the main theorem. Now I want to um, just set up some notation for a little bit uh, to, uh, and then circle back around and say more about how the um, result is proved. So, um, all right, so let's let L of pi s be an automorphic L function. So that I wanna use lambda pi of n for the, uh, the, the Dirichlet series coefficients. Um, this will have an Euler product. Um, principle is degree D, um, although I think, I think for this talk, only D, the only Ds of interest are one and two. <laughs> so you don't lose much by thinking of degree one or degree two. This will have a gamma factor. Um, so again, product of D gamma factors with um, uh, of, of this form. And then I want to normalize things so that the functional equation um, relates the L function at S and at one minus S. Um, and then this, there's this integer Q, Q, Q of pi, which appears in this functional equation. So just as an example, the, the, the you know, the most fundamental example would be to take a, uh, uh, you take a primitive Dirichlet character Q, um, and then this, this Dirichlet L function is the same one we've, I've been talking about this whole talk. And uh, the, the, the gamma factor is this gamma R of either S or S plus one, depending on if the character is even or odd. And then this integer Q is just the, the usual conductor of the character. There's a notion of an analytic conductor, which is the um, it is the product of this integer Q that appeared in the functional equation, and then this product of this uh, this information that comes from the gamma factors. So the the analytic conductor incorporates information from both Q and or little Q, the, the that that conductor and the 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 Archimedean factor, the the, the gamma factors. The analytic conductor is a good measure of the complexity of an L function. Um, and one way to explain that is, is, uh, is by way of the approximate functional equation. So the, the approximate functional equation lets us write an L function as um, essentially as two, two finite sums. So really, uh, there should be some weight function here that, um, that decays quite rapidly outside of the square root of the conductor. Um, so this is a little hand wavy here. Um, but the point is that uh, to represent the L function, to, to, you know, to, to find a, a finite type representation of the L function inside the critical strip, uh, it takes about square root of Q, square root of the analytic conductor um, terms of the Dirichlet series. So the Dirichlet series doesn't converge absolutely inside the critical strip, but we do have this um, representation. Um, if you imagine that these lambda pi events are bounded by um, some kind of divisor function, uh, then you could just plug that in here um, and just put in a, a trivial bound inside the approximate functional equation. And 
you would get a bound of q to the, the analytic conductor to the one over four power. And that corresponds to the, the convexity bound. We don't actually know those, those bounds, but we, um, uh, that would be part of the Ramanujan conjectures, but we, um, we have good bounds on average over n. We don't really need, a, a, need that bound for all n, but on average over n. And so, um, so we do have this convexity bound. So one of the <clears throat> one of the motivating goals in the subject is to prove um, to to beat the convexity bound to prove some um, uh, get some uh, bound that's the analytic conductor to some power strictly less than of one over four. In light of this representation of the, of the Dirichlet series, what that amounts to is proving cancellation in these um, L function coefficients. Uh, because if you just put in, if you just bound everything by one, you get you get the convexity bound. So you have to prove there's some cancellation. Okay, so now um, so now let's, let's talk more about GL two. Um, I said earlier that the, the 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 you know we're going to we're going to view these these Dirichlet L functions as um, the corresponding to the Eisenstein part of some of some GL two family. And so we'll have to talk about GL2 families here. So I want to let HK of Q psi um, be the holomorphic new forms of weight K level Q and central character psi. And then this HITJ thing is the same, except it's just MOS forms, the spectral parameter TJ. So I'll, I'll mostly be stating the results for the MOS forms because it's the MOS forms in the Eisenstein series that go together, and it's the Eisenstein part that gives the um, the Dirichlet L function. But um, if you don't like MOS forms as much, and, and you want to think about holomorphic new forms, you you won't lose a whole lot. Um, so this subconvexity problem for GL two was really um, um, uh, kicked off, I would say, with by by a series of papers by Duke Friedlander and Ivanius. Um, and, um, and then there are many, many other authors that have contributed to this problem. Um, far too many for me to try to even begin naming. One of the big results in this area, uh, in this direction, is due to Michelle and Venkatesh. They, in, in a certain sense, they completely solved the, sub, the subconvexity problem for GL2. Um, they uh, no matter how you want to vary your GL2 cusp form, whether you want to vary the weight or the spectral parameter or the level or uh, anything, they proved uh, subconvexity bound. Um, so in that sense, it's completely solved. Um, for this talk, uh, I'm more focused on the actual exponents. And then, um, so then there's still all sorts of things you can do to um, compare and contrast the strengths of the results. So uh, sort of the state of the art. Uh, so there's, there's work of Blomer and Harkos from 2008. And there's also a um, version of, of a paper of Wu from 2014 that's kind of like more in the style of Michelle and, and Venkatesh um, that uh, for twisted L functions, for, uh, they prove a Burgess quality bound. So they, they prove that amongst the family of twists, uh, they get this exponent three over 16. It's the same exponent that Burgess got. It's, it's using a different method. Uh, it's kind of interesting that these exponents are recurring with different techniques. Um, but for general twists, this is uh, the best result that we have is this Burgess uh, quality result. Um, again, there's some applications of these problems like so one of the reason you could say that the subconvexity problem is, is is a good problem is that um for some applications a convexity bound is completely useless gives you no information but any subconvexity bound then does give you some some information so for example to this question of equidistribution of hinger points or um non-trivial bounds on Fourier coefficients of ternary theta functions. This can tell you about representation numbers. Um, so so th this is a sign that th it's a good problem. 
Okay, so that's that's the Burgess bound is the best we know for general twisted L functions. Um, there are some cases where in GL2, where we have a vial quality bound, like this one over six exponent. Um, there aren't a whole lot of cases, but there are a few. Um, the, I think the earliest I know of is, is due to Anton Good from 1982. So he, he, he was really ahead of his time, I think. Uh, but he proved, like, let's say you take uh, like the Ramanujan delta function, look at the L function associated to that, and look at it in the T aspect. And he um, proved a vial quality bound there. Um, Ivich has a paper from 2001 that I'll, I'll say more about on an upcoming slide where he proves um, vial quality bound for MOS form L functions of level one, where the spectral parameter is becoming large. And then also this Conrad Ivani has found that, that we mentioned earlier about um, these, uh, these quadratic twists of, of, of GL2 plus forms. <clears throat> so here's, if, here's what Ivich does. So Ivich looks at a cubic moment. Um, so just, I, 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 probably, there's, there's probably a lot of notation to take in, but, but just let me say it in words. So you look at the, the spectral parameters Tj in a small window between T and T plus one. So the, the Tj's are, um, uh, we, we kind of know how many there are. There, there's a round capital T of them. Um, or some constant times capital T of them in a small window um, of this size between T and T plus one. So there's like T things in there. And so that's what this is. That's what this left-hand side, that's what the sum is over. And they get these L functions cubed and, and get a bound T to the one plus epsilon. So there's T things in there. And so this is like uh, uh, T to the epsilon bound on average. So the conductor for these L functions is around t squared. Um, also, these L functions are known to be non-negative. And so you can drop all but one term and bound an individual L function. And the, the bound they get by doing this is the conductor to the one over six. So it's a, it's a vial quality exponent. Conrad Ivani has also studied a cubic moment. Um, so what's there? Uh, family. So uh, you might just think of Q being a prime and and forget about M equal, you know, or so I guess you get M equals one and M equals Q. So you, you really get the, the family of cusp forms of level dividing Q. <clears throat> so if you want to handle like twists of the Ramanujan delta function, what you have to do is think about it, you sort of trivially think of it as a cusp form on level Q, uh, as, a, as an old form and um, put it in that family. Um, OK, and so then they study this cubic moment of these um, quadratic twists over this family. The, this, this term here with this integral, uh, this is the Eisenstein part. And so they actually get this Dirichlet L function absolute value to the sixth. Um, and yeah, this, this saying it goes up to 10 is just, it's just some number. So it's, they, um, they get they get for general um, integrals uh, as well. So now the um, um, the overall idea is now the same. So if you have have this bound, then you can drop all but one term, and um, you'll get a um, conductor to the one over six bound. And that's that's how they got their um, their vial um, exponent for the uh, for the Dirichlet function for the quadratic characters. Um, so Ian and I also studied this problem with a cubic moment, and um, our results in this direction is, is this. So you, um, so somehow I think that the, the key thing was figuring out what family to use, and in retrospect, it's almost em embarrassingly simple. Um, but uh, anyway, this is <laughs> the this is the family. So. Anyway, let me just sort of remind you in words again. So F is running over cusp forms with these spectral parameter Tj is up to 10. So just, you know, it's just fixed. Think of it as fixed. And then we have level M dividing Q. Just think of Q as a prime and think of M equals Q. And then we're looking at forms with uh, central character chi bar squared. 
And so in the Conrad of Anya's case, this, their character was quadratic. And so in a sense, they didn't see this. this they, took, they, they took the forms of trivial character. Um, but, but for more general characters, chi, like complex characters, then chi bar squared will um, not be one. And so it actually has a non-trivial central character. Um, and then we, we cook up this family. It's the same sort of thing. You twist it by chi. Uh, this, this term here with the integral represents the Eisenstein series component. And it gives us this absolute value of this L function to the six. And we end up with the same quality bound, like the sort of a Lindelof uh, on average bound for the, for the family. It, oh, I went really fast. So then, um, Okay, so some remarks about this. So the first thing is, so what's what's the deal with this family? Like, why why take f of central character chi bar squared and then twist it by chi? So the reason is, so if you have central character, let's say chi bar squared, and you twist f by a Dirichlet character psi, then it's a kind of a simple thing with modular forms that uh, the 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 twisted form has central character chi bar squared times psi squared. So when you when you twist by a Dirichlet character, the central character gets multiplied by the square. Um, and so this is cooked up. So when you take psi to equal chi, then the twisted form has trivial character again. Okay. Um, so this is how, how this was sort of engineered to, to work. Um, and so that's what, so the second line here is just saying that when you take f twisted by chi, that just means it's a has level q squared and trivial central character. Luckily, we know all these central values are non-negative. Um, uh, this is due to work of, of Guo, extending work of Walsh Bouget. This is this is a 1985 paper of Walsh Bouget. This is not his earlier one that dealt with quadratic twist. This is this is a, a different paper. Um, I think le lesser known than his, his, his other one. Um, anyway, so we know that these central values are, are non-negative and um, um, yeah, and so that's, so we can drop everything except for one term and that's what gives this, this file bound. Um, again, if you, if you don't like MOS forms and prefer to think about holomorphic modular forms, and a similar bound is true, you would have, instead of tj going up to 10, you might have the weight k going up to 10 or anything you like really. Um, and you would have this L function bound. But for holomorphic modular forms, there's no Eisenstein series component. So you'd have to delete that. But we get the same type of bound there. So um, I really don't want to get into the, any of the technical details of, of, of the proof, but um, just to say, uh, what's the overall idea? So the idea that we want, uh, that we're going to follow is to connect this family, this cubic moment family um, of these twisted L functions to a completely different family of L functions. And so the, 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 the dual family that we get led to is a certain modified fourth moment of Dirichlet L functions. Um, so this, this, this theme of connecting different families of L functions has been used by other people. Um, I think the first um, instances are, are due to Kuznetsov um, um, and Motohashi, um, and then other authors, especially Michelle and Venkatesh and Blomer Khan, Blomer Lee Miller have, have, and many others that I'm forgetting, have also developed uh, moment identities connecting different families of L functions. And these are just beautiful formulas, and they, um, I don't know, they're just, I, I just, I just really like them. And, um, but they're also very useful. They, they give us very powerful, um, uh, they're, they're very powerful tools in the, the subject. So to make a very, very long story short, <laughs> um, what happens in our case is by using different summation formulas like the like the Peterson formula or the Brueggemann Kuznetsov formula, um, various Poisson summation formulas, and all sorts of things like that. That for people who work in that area are kind of familiar with. Um, but if you're not, I I don't know how to try to say it in a reasonable way. So I'm so I'm just completely avoiding it. But so after you do all these things, at the end, 
you get led to a dual family. The dual family is um, this fourth moment of Dirichlet L functions modulo Q, but it's modified by multiplication by this character sum. That's this, we call it G of chi psi. And the character sum is, is this. So um, it's a, it depends on these two characters. Chi, remember, was our original character that we started with. Um, and then we're summing over psi. Um, so we get a collection of these character sums as you vary psi. And so it's chi of this, it's a linear fractional transformation in T and in U. And then it's a polynomial in, in, about in, in here that um, this U times T minus one. So it's just this, this character. This is the thing that comes up. So just to say a little bit more about these moment identities. So there's a, there's a famous result of Motohashi where he um, started with the fourth moment of the Riemann zeta function. And then um, after various transformations got led to a cubic moment of, of MOS form L functions. Um, so this is kind of the opposite direction from where I started with. So for, 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 for this talk, we started with, and like with, with Ivich, um, so Ivich's case is like this, this cubic moment. Um, and then when, yeah, so then, so, so there's, there's maybe fan, uh, moment identities going in both directions or with more general weights. Um, for the Dirichlet L function case, so in, in, in my paper um, that I wrote, I, I, I noticed that there was some kind of, this is very hand wavy, some kind of um, moment identity that, involve these cubic moments, but multiplied by um, lambda f of p. So looking at Dirichlet characters mod p, uh, what that does is it introduces this lambda f of p. And this is grossly oversimplified, but this is just to be kind of give you a flavor of, of these different kinds of moment identities. Um, and I think Ian um, Petro was the first to notice this kind of structure um, in this Conrad Ivaniets uh, cubic moment problem. So he started, so he noticed that this cubic, that that this kind of identity holds uh, for the cubic moment. Um, and that's the case where chi is quadratic. Okay. So now one of the main inputs into our uh, proof of the theorem is this is a bound on this character sum. And the, the bound is that if, if Q is cube free, then this character sum is bounded by Q to the one plus epsilon. By the Chinese remainder theorem, this thing will factor out and multiply out. And so really we want to understand this character sum when Q is a prime power. And then the hardest case is when Q is a prime. And when Q is a prime, then we need to use um, the Lean's proof of the Riemann hypothesis for varieties over a finite field. Um, we were, uh, lucky that there was some recent work of Fouvry, Kowalski, Michelle, and Sawin that really um, was helpful in, in proving these results. So it's 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 difficult to bridge the uh, the, the the gap from sort of Deline's work and Katz's work to the applications that we need in analytic number theory. And these authors have been um, working at at making these things more accessible. So if you plug in this pointwise bound on G, so just going back, so just to remind you, so if we have an individual bound on G, that's like Q, that, that will cancel with this one over Q, and then what we need is a bound on the fourth moment of Dirichlet L functions. And um, getting an asymptotic for that is, is, is more difficult, but just getting an upper bound is not hard at all. Um, and we can just get Q to the one plus epsilon as the bound. So that's the overall structure of how the proof goes. But what's going on with this cube free thing? I mentioned, you know, we had theorem one and then another theorem and you know, the second theorem that, that came in a follow-up paper a year or so later, a year or two later. Um, so what's going on with that? So the problem is that for higher prime powers, there's not square root, there's not always square root cancellation in those character sums. Um, and so just to be a little more specific about that, so if, if, if Q is, is P to the K, K is at least three, then in general, or typically there will exist characters such that this character sum is bigger than Q times some power, like let's say P to the alpha for some exponent alpha. 
and this exponent alpha will be a half integer. So, um, okay, so that's that's sort of the bad news, but maybe we can get around it. So the idea to get around this problem is to, first of all, understand, well, how big can this alpha be? And then once we you know, have a handle on how big alpha can be for a given value of alpha, what are the characters where this large value is attained? Okay, so can we understand the structure of this set of, of these, um, we call them the singular characters where they uh, where this you get an exceptionally large value of this character sum. If we can get our hands on what those sort of bad or the singular characters are, then what we could try to do is bound the fourth moment along uh, among only the the subset of the of the singular characters. And so if our g sum is uh, if our character sum g is sort of p to the alpha times as big, then we hope to save this factor p to the alpha. Um, when we uh, sum over, when we when we focus only on the um, the singular characters, so that's the overall um, strategy. So um, the the singular characters are not just some random set of characters. It turns out that they form a coset of the group of characters modulo d for some d between p and p to the k minus one. So um, this leads us to want to understand the fourth moment of Dirichlet L functions along a coset. So just to be a little more specific about it, um, so let's take Q to be a prime cubed. Um, so it turns out only it's only when P is one mod four that there are singular characters. Now if P is three mod four, then there aren't any singular characters. We always get sort of cancellation for those primes, or those prime powers. But if P is one mod four, then there are exactly two times P minus one of these singular characters where this this g sum is exactly an absolute value equal to q times square root of p. So it's definitely square root of p times bigger. And then we know that the, the singular characters are, are a union of two cosets. Um, where you see this capital psi here is a, some coset representative, and then it's the, 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 the subgroup is the group of characters mod p. So um, to this end, just as a sample result in this direction, we have a bound. Uh, like, so we take, let's, let's say chi has conductor P cubed, and then let's say you sum over all the characters modulo P squared. So chi times this eta, this is running over the, this coset, right, where chi is the coset representative and eta is running over the elements of the subgroup. And so this subgroup has, so this is uh, a small subfamily um, in this whole group of characters. And, but we get this um, Lindelof on average bound. And we have a more general version that's just more complicated to state, and that version is sufficient for the uh, for this other result. So, just as one uh, little remark, the uh, this 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 fourth moment along a coset bound, um, I want to argue that this is uh, similar in spirit to um, a result of Ivaniance. And so I want to, so the result of Ivaniance is, is this. So, um, so yes, this paper from 1980 where he proved a, an upper bound on the fourth moment of zeta in a short interval. And basically he can take the interval of size t to the two thirds. So take delta equals t to the two thirds and he gets this good bound. So this is kind of in line with this, what I was, connecting back like to the beginning of the talk with these fourth moment of the, the zeta function questions. But th this, is a sh this is an upper bound on the, on the short interval. I'd like to say that this is very much analogous to this, this Dirichlet L function problem. So because, um, why is that? So we should think of this, this interval t, mi t minus delta to t plus delta as a small neighborhood around the character n to the i t um, of radius delta, let's say. Okay, so those are the things that are close by. Um, now we want to do the same thing with char Dirichlet characters. So let's take a Dirichlet character of conductor Q, and then now let's define a small neighborhood, let's say around that character, to be all the characters psi such that when you look at chi times psi bar, that has conductor at most delta. So for example, let's take Q is equal to a prime cubed, and delta is equal to the prime squared, then the set of characters where this conductor is at most p squared, that's exactly this coset. And that's exactly like this short interval 
um, like Ivani has had. And so, um, so this, I think, has a, a similar type of result. Uh, it also, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, and so another another thing I find interesting about all this is that there's these. It's, it kind of all looks very circular. So the we've got this family, this cubic moment family that we start with. We end up with some fourth moment problem, and that with modified with this G sum. And then if you put in absolute values and bound the G sum, then you want to understand the fourth moment uh, of, of say Dirichlet functions maybe along a, a coset. Um, and then to, to, to solve that problem, we go back to a different cubic moment. <laughs> but it's, it's, so it almost seems circular, but it's not because we're putting, we're doing estimates along the way, we're putting in absolute values. And, and, and um, yeah, so I think, yeah, I think I, I should stop around now. I'll, I had a few last slides, so I'll just skip through and, and just say thanks to everyone for, for listening. <laughs>